What up, what up? We got a legend in the building today. Looking, what looking, up, Chris? <laughs> looking like new money. Got my man, hey, man, Christopher Play Martin in the building. Welcome to Vlad TV. What up, Play? I'm good. How are you, man? I'm excellent. I'm excellent, man. Good to see you, brother. You're looking good. Hey, man. God's grace and mercy and a little just for men. <laughs> I know all about that, brother. All right, so let's get started. Because you got a, you got an amazing story. You are part of hip-hop history. Um, you know, you were one, one of, one part of, uh, one of the early mainstream crossover groups in hip-hop. So I can't wait to dive deep into your story. Um, you're from New York. What part? Queens, New York, East Elmhurst to be specific, but we, I claim Corona Hurst, Corona and East Elmhurst, Queens, New York. Yeah. Gotcha. Queens has spit out a lot of rap stars. It's something about Queens water or something. It's so well, many. We didn't know it. You know what I'm saying? We didn't know it. I mean, you know, everybody was just friends doing what we did to get together wherever we got together at in that particular place for me was a place called 127 Park. We called it the Seven. And, um, but, you know, right next door is Corona. So you had G-Rap and Polo. You had Kwame. We had Herbie Lovebug, you know, Kid and I. And then a lot of people would just come there. Eric B, um, you know, not far from me as well. Uh, later entering Rakim. Um, just a whole bunch, man. I mean, a lot of cats that became well-known eventually would frequent our area. I think the girls had a lot to do with it, but also the park jams. You know, we were, the Seven, it was called the Seven, or Bootyland, was very infamously known for our park jams. So that was the place to be, you know, by uh, any means necessary. When you were coming up, hip hop, it wasn't the same landscape as we know it today. Um, you were there in the early days of hip hop. What, what did it look like back in those days? In, at the time, was it even called hip hop? Well, I'm glad you said that because that's something that I teach. You know, I've been to several universities and been an uh, artist in residence at several. And whenever I talk about it, I said well, I, that era, I would call what would eventually would be called hip hop. Because basically it was a... Uh, it was a it was a form of escapism, you know. As you probably know or can remember, a lot was going on in New York fiscally. You know, we were being abandoned by the government, D.C., and um, a lot of money wasn't given to us. So our after school programs were eliminated, music and art programs was eliminated. Then you had the height of crime, the gangs, all of that. So and then you know even from a more social situation, a lot of the government or the powers that be was instrumental in breaking up homes where they weren't going to publicly assist families that would have two incomes coming in the household. So someone came up with the bright idea, let's get the man out of the house. Or the man might have came up with the idea, let me get out of the house so we get this government money. And that might have been probably was the beginning of the end. So a lot of stuff was going on. And it just got to the point with the heat, especially in the summertime and stuff, where there's that phrase, that cliche, the music calms the savage beast. So when Cats was coming out, bringing their systems in the park or the block parties and stuff, it was more about just not having to think about what was going on at home or what was waiting for us at home, you know. And um, so I had a lot to do with it, a lot. And then it was disco. That was the music. You know, and then, uh, you know, we could get into it, how the evolution of it began. But it was it was basically escapism, you know. Got you. You you talked about the landscape of New York City and how it was crime ridden. The, 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 the government really did abandon um, New York. It's not the New York that we know today. Did you ever get caught up in the streets yourself? Very much so. I mean, at that time, we didn't have rappers that we could look up to or aspire to. My heroes were the ghetto stars. You know, I wanted to be like Fat Cat. I wanted to be like Alpo, Pappy, 
excuse me, Pappy Mason, Bimbo, any of those cats that I saw at that time from afar, that was my look of success um, in a weird warp type of way. Then not to mention my father, who was out there in them streets and very successful, at least to the appearance of the neighborhood and others, driving the best car you could drive, dressing the way he drove. I mean, when I went to the movies to go see the black exploitation films, that look was right there in my home. You know what I'm saying? So for me, when I did go to school and um, when I went to school and we had these things called the assemblies where you had to wear white shirts with dark pants, it'd be like once a month, you wouldn't go to a regular class. That day, I think it was like on a Wednesday, everybody, all the classes would come to the auditorium for an assembly. And with the assembly, they'd have a special guest. It would either be a bank president or a firefighter, these people that you could aspire to be. But when they would describe their life at home, it wasn't anything I could relate to. They didn't talk about, you know, when you flicked on the lights in the middle of the night in the kitchen, how thousands of roaches would run for cover. They didn't talk about if you didn't have any heat in your home, how your father, when my father was home and not in prison, would talk about, hey, make sure that you put the oven door down and put this oscillating fan on the door so the heat could spread out throughout the house in the winter. They didn't tell any little story, so I couldn't relate to what these guests would talk about in the assemblies. But when I saw the black exploitation films with the Superfly and across 110th Street and then walking right out of my front door and seeing where the girls was going to be at, the fly cars and the jewelry, I'm seeing cats that was more what I could identify with. And that was my influence and my inspiration. I wanted to be them by any means necessary. Um, were you ever involved in any violent incidents? What type of crimes were you getting involved in at the young age? Sticking people up. Oh, stick up kid. Yeah. That was the thing to be. Either a person at you, stick up, whatever the case may be. I mean, I don't glorify it. I was very stupid. You know, a matter of fact, I was so stupid to the point where the cat stick in my mind and others, my, my boys and stuff, we praised those who were just coming out of prison. You know, I wanted to go to prison to get that name. You know what I'm saying? All of that. I remember stupid stuff I did, hopefully that the cops would catch me so that people could hear, you know, I didn't have the name play at the time. But my father, who was very successful in a, in a, in a uh, I, he was a very successful urban pharmaceutical engineer. <laughs> That's what, that's what we'll call it. And um, my father was uh, very successful by appearance. You know, he had the, back then it was the Mark, what was it, the Mark IV Continental car, the whole nine white walls, yep. tires, the whole nine. And um, he got himself, and this is things he talks about and shares with people. He's actually done a book. Uh, it got to the point where he decided to rob a bank and he made the front page of the Daily News and uh, whatever the other big paper was in New York. Uh, my mother right off the bat was humiliated thinking that this was embarrassing for her in our community, in our neighborhood. So I, what she felt, I was kind of bracing myself for, oh man, this is shame on the family. Cause the feds came six in the morning, busting down the door, me and my sisters, all of us face down on the floor, all of that kind of stuff. So, and this was his first time being publicly known for going to prison. You know, some of my growing up, I didn't have a regular weekend where you look forward to the weekend and you didn't have to go to school and play with friends. Mine was I had to go with my grandfather to go visit my father up in prison, Lewisburg. I forgot some of the other prisons. I remember when he went to Lewisburg, some of the cats from the, uh, what was the big stuff that went on politically that a lot of cats got locked up for? It'll come to me when I stop thinking about it, but he was locked up with those, those cats. So for me, when they when that happened and it brought all kinds of attention to our home, I'm thinking, oh, this is embarrassing because of how my mother's feeling. Not to mention my father robbed my mother's bank. <laughs> Hold on, this is a so bank. Anyway, that she, it's a bank that she worked in? No, my mother worked at Burlington Industries in the city, Fifth Avenue, and I believe in the 50s or 60s, mm -hmm. those streets. Her company, Burlington Industries, right at the floor of her building was the bank she banked at, which was called Irving Trust. He robbed that bank and they knew her from her cashing her checks or whatever she did there with the bank. 
So anyway, um, he even just recently told me more of the story, which is truly hilarious. And I'm sure it wasn't funny at the time. But anyway, um, so I'm thinking um, the family's shamed and we're going to be embarrassed. But my first touch of fame in a, in a weird way was everybody remembers back in those days who was old enough to remember the community stores. You know, you didn't have malls then. You had mom and pop stores, candy stores. There was no McDonald's. You know, you got your little burgers and stuff from these little stores. So the big thing f back then for me and people my age was candy, you know, or potato chips, onion and garlic potato chips, barbecue potato chips, all of that stuff. So I'll never forget one particular store that was very common and popular in the, in the area. I went in there to, I guess, get some candy or something. And I heard the people behind the counter in the back where they did the hamburgers and stuff, whispering like, yo, you know who son that is? You know who son that is? So they caught my attention. My father is naturally bald. He doesn't have any hair anywhere on his body. This was before Michael Jordan, any of that kind of stuff. His nickname in the streets was Skull or Scalp because he didn't have any hair. So when they were whispering like, yo, you know who son that is? Yo, 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 yo. They said, someone was like, who, who? That's little Skull. That's scalp son. And that day, they gave me free candy. Whatever I wanted, they gave it to me free. So I'm like, get in the paper, front paper, <laughs> rob a bank, free candy? <laughs> hey, you know what I'm saying? It's a little more complex than that. But um, that's the thing that kind of took a, a certain main direction in my life in regards to trying to naively and ignorantly put two and two together, seeing what was happening on the big screen with Superfly and across 110th Street and all of that. Then my father, his lifestyle, and then that incident among others that happened. Like we had stick up kids in the, in the neighborhood and some wouldn't touch me because of my father and who my father, his affiliates and stuff was. So it was a real interesting time for an impressionable knucklehead on the come up, you know? Gotcha. But I don't glorify it at all. I was very, you know, I had so many, I had so many close calls. You know, God getting my attention. It's it, it isn't even funny. Funny now, but it wasn't funny then. So, was there a particular incident? Uh, did something happen in the streets that made you say, you know what? I know what's down this road, but I, I'm gonna go a different path. Let me go down the straight and narrow. Was it something that just led you out of the streets? It wasn't one particular incident. It was a combination of things. I can remember a time, I, I used to have a sawed off shotgun. Uh, it was, uh, matter of fact, it was considered uh, worth quite a bit of money. It was kind of ruined because, you know, got sawed off. But um, that was my tool of choice, so to speak. Um, and then I remember uh, me and a, another homeboy who passed, God bless his soul, uh, we would go, we would treat it like a nine to five job, but like we had the night shift. Like we'd have a regular day in the park, hang out with the girls, all of that. But then when the sun went down and at a certain time, you know, we had this weird thing where it's like, you know, it's time to, what they would say today, time to go put in that work, which was, we was, we was out there in the, you know, in the nighttime. Uh, punks, you know, Stick it up whoever we felt was a victim, but sometimes it would be a woman, somebody's mother. I'll never forget, it was uh, Grandmaster Flash in the Furious Five was coming to Queens. And we, you know, we didn't have a regular job. That was our job. So we wanted to get money to get the tickets. We wanted to get that money to get the latest gear, you know what I'm saying, for the event. So I remember this particular night, that was the goal. But it was raining all that day and it was raining all that night. And it felt like, you know, our plans were going to be ruined. So finally it stopped raining. And there's a reason why the rain is important. It uh, stopped raining. And we're like, yeah, yeah, we get out there. So we catch somebody's mother, the way she was walking, more elderly, coming off the bus. And um, it had stopped raining. So her umbrella was um, folded up. The, the problem I had with this particular shotgun I had, which was a Winchester, it had a hair trigger to it. So even if you just tapped it, sometimes the trigger would go off. So that night when we were getting ready to, to put in that work, uh, that night I uh, chose not to put any bullets in the, in the gun. And my homie was like, yo, you forgot to put bullets in. The joke back then, if you could remember, anybody old enough to remember, 
was it got to a point out there in the streets where some people had fake guns and some people had real guns. And some people would take on the challenge of, oh, it's fake, and challenge you with it. And sometimes that'd be a, a life mistake. But the joke I had was nobody ever questioned this joint I had. You know what I'm saying? So I got lazy and didn't want to put bullets in it that night because it was going to be easy work. So we hiding in the bushes. Woman gets off the bus. We roll up on her. For the first time ever in our career, <laughs> she decides to fight back. Now, remember, she has an umbrella. My, I'm sick. I'm stupid now. I'm not a, this ain't about glorifying nothing. You know what I'm saying? My thing is, if I have to shoot somebody, I'm going for the body. Because at least they may have a chance to survive and live, whatever. I'm not going to go for the head. Well, when she decided to fight back, she took a hum, her umbrella, her umbrella and swung at me. And she hit the, the gun. And the gun went up to her head. And the trigger went off. I knew that would have, uh, you know what I'm saying, you fill in the gaps. I was so grateful that, that out of all the nights, I didn't put any bullets in that gun. My dude knew that. His name was Everlasting. Cats from around the way know what I'm talking about. Um, we both knew this about the gun. It was almost like time stopped and went into slow motion because we both looked at each other and we knew what just happened and what could have happened. So that was one of those times that just never left me because even when I thought about it shortly after that, I knew there was a sense that I wasn't really built for that. I knew I probably would have turned myself in because my conscience would have ate me alive. You know what I'm saying? Witnessing and being a part of something like that. So it was situations like that. It was one time where a cop caught me right after I, I sold the, the, the shotgun and traded it for three snub nose 38s and two high powered pellet guns. For those who lived in New York at the time, we had a mayor by the name of Mayor Koch who had just passed this law that whoever was, because the gun thing was getting out of hand. So this thing was whoever was found with a gun was going to get a certain amount of years. And for every bullet found in the gun and on your person, there'd be a year for every bullet. So I just finished doing this transaction, got some money, got traded the shotgun for these uh, 38 snub noses, yada, yada, yada. And I got all this money on me. And like, excuse the term, an asshole, I decided to hop the train style. I had all this money. Back then, what was it like? What was the thing like back then? It was cent? like 75 cents or something to ride the, it's like you know, 50 ride the train in New York. Um, so I have the train style. Hear this yell. Long story short, cop gets me, drags me in this holding cell, these little brief holding cells in the subway system in New York. Gives me a Martin Luther King speech. The whole time in my knapsack are these guns with shells, all of them in my knapsack, looking like I'm a student in the middle of the day. So he yells at me. He's like, yo, um, you should be in school. What I should do is throw you up against the wall, search your bag, take you down to the station. Because he thought I had books in my bag. Take you down to the station. Let, you know, your mother and father come and pick you up. That'll teach you a lesson. But he looked at me in my eye. He said, but you know what? There's something about you, and I'm going to let you go right now. Show me some ID. I had no ID. He gets furious again and decides to give me the Martin Luther King speech again. And he says, you know what? Like I said, it's something about you. Get out of here, don't let me ever see you again. If he would've went in that bag, your whole life this wouldn't be. Changed. This wouldn't be. So wow. it's stuff like that, you know what I'm saying? A lot more. But like I said, I take these stories when I speak and share, letting some know who know. Like I, my thing with this is, because I got kicked out of five high schools. My thing with kids is, or students is, I might not tell you what to do, but I can sure not be able to tell you what not to do. You know, that that's my angle, that's my aspect. But yeah, that's that life. Wow, great stories. Uh, rapping, did you always want to be a rapper? How did you start rapping? <laughs> the answer to most of these questions will always be women. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, it don't get no more complicated than that. It's not even complicated as women. But no, I mean, again, we touched on it prior to it even being called hip hop. You know, it was just something we did for escapism to have fun, to meet the girls, the girls to meet the guys, 
all of that. So for me, you know, when this thing starts, it's interesting because I used to be in a band many, many, many lifetimes ago. And one of the members in the band was a guy by the name of Clarence uh, Stanley. And Clarence, the nickname was Smokey. He was a drummer in the band we was in. He too, experimenting in the streets, parents getting worried. He's, they sent him up to Mount Vernon to live, thinking he would stay out of trouble there. Make a long story short, every once in a while he would come back to visit the old neighborhood and he would always tell me and the other, you know, this was in my cornball days when I was like that nerd before getting introduced to the streets. He's like, yo, I'm telling you, you need to check out this thing they're doing. Let me show you. And he got on, we was in one of our people's parents' home and he got on our, their turntable and was doing his thing with the thing, but he, he wasn't doing it right. You know what I'm saying? Well, looking back on it now, we didn't know what the heck he was talking about. Uh, that cat was the original member of... Um, What's the group that uh, Master Don and the Masters of Ceremony? Yep. He was with that group. And he was trying to tell us about what would be called hip hop. So for me, I experimented with my mother, mother and father's turntables in the house. That didn't work out well. I did my break dancing thing to, in regards to, I guess, finding my identity in this thing that was gonna become a culture. But then when it got to getting on the microphone, and doing those rhymes at the age of one, I just begun at the age of two, I knew what to do. All of those rhymes, you know, it, it seemed like the fit and I liked the way the, the girls were responding. So that was that was my thing, you know, and the crew that I was with at the time, we was like that one rare crew from our area that would go uptown, would go to Harlem, you know, would go to the places Queens cats ain't supposed to go. But that's just how hungry we was for whatever this thing that was was birthing at the time. What was your original rap name? <laughs> uh, that's funny too. It was, you know, I, I tell when I speak to students, I say, you'll never guess what the number one thing I wanted when I was really getting into this thing that would be this culture. So I said, take a guess. They go, women, cars, jewelry. I said, no. The thing I wanted so bad that I identified with cats that I looked up to in the street was they all had dope nicknames. I wanted a nickname so bad. So the first nickname to my recollection I had was called was Chris C. But when you said it fast, it was suspect, you know, <laughs> Chris C. So I'm like, nah, that ain't gonna work. But one of the things that I did too, the first school I was accepted to high school was the High School of Art and Design. So I'm a self-taught artist. So I used to paint to get, you know, ends, paint. Uh, people's names and graffiti on their jeans. Back then, if you remember, it was the Lee jeans, and it wasn't no skinny jeans, and it wasn't no boot cut. It was the, you know, bell bottom. So it was enough real estate on the leg to put some names on there. And that, what was going on with my father at the time, and and me just the becoming of, was that I really wanted to hang out with these cats. Like we had cats like Choco Bean and June Bug and Beanie. All these cats I looked up to in the neighborhood that had it on lock. Big medallions, the nylon underwear, you know, in the summertime, you know, all of that stuff. It was good times in New York uh, in spite of other things that I share. So one of the ways I began to have an identity and get the attention of these guys was they wanted to know who was doing these jeans. And they found me, or I was around to be found. And uh, these cats, you know, I would charge 50 cents to 75 cents a letter on a person's leg. So the cats would want their jeans to be done. And I'm intimidated because these cats are the real deal. They ain't no, they real. <laughs> you know, these cats was doing time like it was like nothing. Do time in the winter, get out in the summer, <laughs> all, you know, swollen muffin. But... Um, so I got their attention and I'm, I'm feeling like, yo, these cats know me and I'm doing their jeans. So they'd be like, you know, I, regular cats jeans I was doing, I already had quite a stack of jeans to be done because I wasn't a great businessman then. I was just collecting the money and I'll get to your jeans. So when these cats came up to me, intimidating as all get out and be like, yo, you know, I want my jeans done. How much it is to do it? So that's 75 cents a letter. They're like, so when can they get done? These cats wanted their jeans done like next week or tomorrow and stuff. And I'm like, nah, I got other people's jeans I got to do. I can have your jeans ready in a month. They wasn't having that. These cats would just throw me like a $100 bill, $200 to put them at the front of the line. 
And I'm like, yo, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but the matter, I'm a poor businessman, keep this in mind. Or my assembly line wasn't up to par. I was taking on more than I could chew. So when these cats, was, it was time for their jeans to be done, their jeans weren't done. So here I am with knots in my stomach. I can't frequent the park or any of these places that we would all hang out at because I know they're going to come looking for me for their jeans. But what saved me a lot of times, which I'm <laughs> sad to say, is these cats would usually end up getting locked up. And when they got locked up, I didn't have to give them their <laughs> jeans. You know what I'm saying? So here was $100, $200 I was getting. You know, it was like free money. But that was another way of me beginning to be on the radar in regards to being known by these guys I wanted to be known by really, really bad. I wanted that affiliation. So so did that segue in some way to, to that nickname you was looking for, to that? Oh, yeah, I got off track with that. So what ended up happening was my signature to know that I did the jeans. For some reason, well, all of us at that age, we loved the Playboy magazines. So I mastered the bunny, the iconic bunny with Playboy. But when I did the bunny, I had one of his ears would be bent. So I had, you'd, I'd have your name on the side, but you knew I did it because I put, I put that bunny somewhere. So I got the name Playboy, you know, and I put Playboy Mr. C. So some of the things happened with that for the sake of time, but as time went on and then I'm doing my thing, trying to be what I'm going to be on the microphone and so forth and so on, People just started putting two and two together. The Playboy Mr. C, another guy had the name Mr. C. He wanted to fight me over the name. So we went through all of that stuff with that. It wasn't really worth it. So it just ended up being Playboy. And then as, you know, my real name is Christopher, but back then when you know me good, you're just gonna call me Chris. So the same thing with Playboy, close friends would drop the boy and just say, yo, what's up, Play? things like that. And then at the time, I think some guys weren't really interested in calling another guy Playboy because that's almost like saying you're better than me with the women. So I think that had something to do with it too. So yeah, yeah, that's how that came about. Short edited version. Play, your, one of your original groups that you rapped in, was Herbie Lovebug part of it? Mm-hmm. Uh, we were, we call ourselves Quicksilver and the Super Loving Three. What Herbie's name was Herbie Lovebug. My name was Play Playboy, and a real great friend of mine still to this day. He's really the third member of Kid and Play, officially. His name is Jerome, but we call him Romeo. So those was just names. I, I, like I just explained why my name became my name, and it's a little deeper than that. But Herbie, you know, coming from Haiti, he embraced pop culture uh, big time. So you got this movie, Walt Disney movie, Herbie the Love Bug. You know what I'm saying? And in Rome, we just called him Rome. So we put an end, uh, O at the end of it, Romeo. Plus he had it going on with the ladies too. As a matter of fact, he was almost like my, you know, my, 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 my uh, idol, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? Until I really got into my own. But um, what ended up becoming our theme or our gimmick was we call ourselves the super lovers because we had these lover names. That was our theme, our gimmick, our whatever you want to call it. So yeah, Herbie was... Um, you know, an MC along with me and Romeo and our DJ was, uh, well, it was interesting because before there was a Quicksilver, there was a rocking B, Bernard Doss, who was Romeo's brother. We used to rock with King Charles. So those who know New York and that whole Queens thing, King Charles was considered one of the biggest DJs, especially as far as sound systems was concerned. You had um, Cats from Brooklyn, DJ Flowers and all of that as well. But you had Donnie Dance Master, you had Infinity Machines, you had King Charles, you had all of these. So the sound systems were, were beasts, earthquake speakers, the whole nine, St. Gabriel's where the jams took place and all of that. But King Charles, who was a Jamaican, all basically he was the financier of it all, you know, that got what needed to get to blow parks apart was just, that was his role. He wasn't a DJ or nothing like that, but he controlled things. He was smart enough to see the future of what we would call hip hop coming. Because prior to that, all those DJs played mostly was disco. But he's seeing this thing beginning to happen. I remember we did a jam, I believe it was in Jamaica, Queens, or it might've been Jersey, where we, when we was with Curtis Blow, who 
there's no words to express how much that man means to me, him and Jalil from Houdini. But um, we did a jam where Curtis, we were performing with Curtis Blow, of course we were the openers. And um, that was when Run was a DJ, Run DMC. He wasn't a DJ, he was called the son of Curtis Blow. He was Curtis Blow's DJ. So um, we, that was our taste of where King Charles performed in Brooklyn, all around New York. We were his secret weapon that when he saw the crowd or if we were dealing with another DJ group that did have some form of hip hop in it, we were his, we were his answers to that. So that was our thing of traveling, which meant the world to us. We might as well have been on a world tour because at that time, you know, I never really had really, really been out of Queens or the, 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 the comfort of Queens um, like that to be getting on stages and rapping and, and having a good time and experimenting, experiencing crowds and all of that. You, you, you and Chris Reed, the world knows him as Kid. Right. Second part of... Brother Beige. <laughs> second part of Kid and Play. Mm. Y'all, how did y'all even come together? Because you started off with a completely different group. How did you, you two merge? Well, Kid used to be part of a group called uh, the Turnout Brothers. That was another group, but that was when Bernard was no, when Rock and B was no longer with us. He wanted to be an MC instead of being a DJ, so he formed another group. So, but in Bernard was like I said, Rome's brother. So there was this friendly competition going on, but as time went on. And we're getting older. Just remember that scene, well, any scene of any famous group we know, like the Temptations and all of that, even the Five Heartbeats, how you got those early members. But when things aren't going their way right away, you have those members that kind of like, yo, I'm out of here. Or I have to start making money. This rap thing ain't really making any money. Cats are beginning to have babies with their girlfriends. Parents are beginning to look at us side eye like, yo, you know, you ain't putting no money in here. Either you're going to go to school or you're gonna get a job. So as that was happening, the two left that were standing was Kid and I. But prior to that, it kind of goes into a question you asked earlier that was interesting. It got to a point where I saw where my life was going, which was like real bad. My father had just did one of his longest prison stints. He had become a born again Christian. So he's like, you know, coming down on me real heavy. Life is getting serious now, you know? And I'm seeing things that I just ain't got the heart for. I remember somebody I was with, stick up kid or cat out there that I admired, gangster, whatever you want to call it, it said the best way that you're going to be successful in this life is you're going to have to be willing to kill your mother and have no conscience about it. That's the, those who look like they win. I ain't that guy. Like I said, I ain't built for that. So for me, the interesting part that kid played in my life prior to us forming this duo was that <laughs> when I would see him from afar, his gear was tight. Back then it was the Jordache jeans, Adidas sneakers, whatever, but he was still that nerd. Big Afro, Coca-Cola Coca glass bottle, thick glasses, red like, but he was a cool looking nerd, but a nerd nevertheless. So as things began, the groups and he and I, the only two left standing, you know, I'm, um, at that time, probably trying to get my GED or whatever the case may be. And he and I start hanging out because our third, like I said, our first official member back then, quite as kept, is Romeo, Jerome Doss. Kid and I would have, uh, what would you call um, when you have a job? We would have, um, oh, you have a job and you punch in for your job. You have your... Yeah, you punch your clock. Yeah, but it's called a certain... Nine to five? What are we talking? Yeah, it'll come to me when I stop thinking about it. So anyway, kid played ball. My man Rome played ball. In the daytime, they did the ball thing. That wasn't me. My thing was nightlife. Rome did the nightlife too. So when it, the sun started coming down, that's when I would come into the park. Kid would have to be home because he was dealing with a real strict father. So he, he had to be home by a certain time. I'd meet up with Rome. Shift. That's what the word I was looking for, when you had your shift. So we had shifts. Kid had the Rome shift in the daytime playing ball, had the Rome shift at nighttime when it was time to get out there, girls, yada, yada. So um, after a while, for whatever reason, over a period of time, I started hanging out 
or coming around kid more often because now I wanted to change my life. And I'm watching him from afar. I'll never forget one time I was hanging out in his house because uh, I was a bad influence on kid. I caught him how to not go to school and cut classes and all that stuff. So one day, you know, I, we end up cutting class. His father's at work. We're at his house. I'm there late enough for, what's the name of that show? Jeopardy comes on where you got to answer the question by asking a question. And it, it's on, and I'm hearing Kid give the answers to every one of these joints. So I'm like looking at this guy like, who the heck am I? Who is this I'm with? You know what I'm saying? But it intrigued me. And fast forward to the point where since I felt like I blew it in school, it was too late for me to, to do it the right way. I barely got my GED. I remember one time coming to him and a young lady I was seeing at the time, she was doing the school thing too. I said, listen, you know, I, I, I want to learn words. You know, I was real rough, man, real rough around the edges. It's, um, it's almost, that's the reason why we did the movie Class Act, because that was us. So I come to him and I'm like, you know, dude, I want to learn words. If I say something the wrong way, would you correct me? If I stop you and I hear you say a word, you know, I want to let you know I'm going to stop you and ask you what that word means. This is my unorthodox way of learning things. And I'll never forget, I thought it was going to take a while for us to, to have that example. And he stops. And he, I mean, I say, I, I tell him that. And he's like, are you sure? I say, yeah. He said, you really sure? I said, yeah. He's making me mad now. He's like, are you really sure you want me to do it? I'm like, now nah, I'm ready to hit him. I'm like, yeah, man, what? Now I can tell he already has a word in mind that I've been saying. So I think he's going to bring up some big word I've been trying to say. He goes, man, it's breakfast. I hate when you say breakfast. You say breakfast. It's breakfast. I wanted to punch him in the face so bad. I'm like, breakfast? I want, you know, I want to learn a more complicated word. Breakfast. So I'll never forget that moment. That was like the first of him knowing pretty much what our rhythm is going to be in regards to me just learning the best way I can by the people that I'm around. There's one young lady that was in my life, lovely woman, because I, you know, like I said, self-taught artist. First school I was accepted to that I blew was the High School of Art and Design. And she was an artist in the same school. So I said the same thing to her, but there was no word she had in mind. She too already had something in mind. I thought it was going to be a word. She hated the fact that whenever we ate together, I would cling my fork against my teeth. That was her way of trying to refine me. Like, you know, when you eat, stop clinging your fork. Okay? It's funny when you bring that to certain people, what they may tell you has been annoying to them all this time. I remember one girl I was with and we got into this big argument. I think we broke up and everything. And out of the blue, she just goes, and I hate when you sing the words to the song before the singer sings it. You know, <laughs> it's crazy, man. But anyway, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I hate the way you sing the words to the song before the singer sings it in the record. Because I'm thinking I'm impressing her. Like, you know, I know the words to this joint. Come to find out she can't stand it. You know, before you blew, um, you guys, Kim Play, Salt and Pepper, and Martin Lawrence, did y'all all work at Sears Roebuck? We did and we didn't. We didn't all work there at the same time. Got you. I was, that was right when I was really getting my life together to get a nine to five. All of us were going through things where our parents says, you got to get a job or you're going to get out of here. I was the first one to find that job and being homeboy and friends to my cats, knowing they're going through the same thing, kid, Herbie, so forth and so on. Kid came on next, then Herbie, then Salt and Pepper, and Martin Lawrence was last. The girls weren't there when I was there, but... We were all so close, Herbie, Kid, and I, that when it was time for them to get off work, and I knew what time that was and when payday was, because I had went through it, they would call me and say, yo, we're getting ready to get off. We're going to go hit this club, go do this, go do that. And one particular night, they were telling me how they wanted me to meet these girls, or this one girl, and it was Cheryl, Salt at the time, and that's how I met her, hanging out after they got off work. Martin came, he was last. Martin used to work in the gas station across the street, from the Sears and Roebuck Center we worked at. And then eventually he came and worked there. But I didn't meet Martin and get to know Martin until he was uh, uh, booked or you know casted in House Party. 
And then y'all just put two and two together that you actually worked in the same area? Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about you guys starting to blow up. Or even before blowing up. You got a record. She's a skeezer. And Rock Me. How big were those records for you? They did well in the tri-state area. And then some. New York, Jersey, and uh, Philly. We, you know, a lot of people want to give credit to New York and to a certain degree, to a certain degree justifiably so, for the birth or the, the growth of hip hop. But really, it was Philly. It took a while for New York to even have us on regular rotation on their radio. Philly was the first one to do that. A woman by the name of Lady B. She was the first one to get rap on rotation on an FM station. Some people want to give that to Mr. Magic, God bless his soul, but him and Fly Tie will actually tell you it was really Lady B. They had it on one of those um, college stations, you know, uh, public uh, public uh, radio stations and things like that. But um, so Philly showed major love, uh, New York major love, Jersey major love, and believe it or not, Ohio. Uh, we were signed to Sutra Records, the same label that the Fat Boys was on, uh, our uh, thought and our uh, strategy at the time was what they called cover records because a lot of people was doing them, you know, taking a record and maybe putting a, a parody and stuff to it. So She's a Skeezer was really, some people would call it a ripoff or our way of saluting in a way, Run DMC with my Adidas, but we called it my Skeezer. Uh, then you had uh, Falco with Rock Me Amadeus. So we did this joint called Rock Me. Um, I know I'm like, oh, All Hail the Drum. That was an original one. And then we had a girl group we were, we were producing called The Celebrity Club. They did a, a, a cover off of Curtis Blow's If I Rule the World, but theirs was called Girls Rule in the World. But we had love with the radio stations in New York and a lot of the clubs that were supporting hip hop. We were doing really well as far as traveling outside of those areas, you know, nothing yet. Got you. Okay, 88 rolls around. Two hype album drops. But prior to two, the two hype album dropping, Salt and Pepper blow. Mm -hmm. They blew before you guys did. Mm -hmm. Now it's your turn. Gold album on the two, on the two hype albums. Probably more like over platinum, but anyway, go ahead. You know how that goes. <laughs> it's all good. I'm not we sure. We made up for it in other areas. Everybody knows y'all for that famous kickstep kick step dance. Who came up with that? That 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 move came out of uh came out of uh desperation, so to speak. Uh when it was time for us to finally start traveling on the road and doing national tours. The promoters were still, one in particular, Ricky Walker, who had the Slammin' 88 tour, uh, co-headlined by Salt Pepper and Keith Sweat. Most phenomenal time in my, in my life, being a first major tour. He, he was feeling us, but because of our girls and Herbie putting that pressure on saying, we want them with us too, kid and play. But he wasn't going to pay for us to have dancers. Because when you saw our music videos, then we always had dancers and we're dancing. So we're like, yo, we can't bring, they're not going to give us the money for dancers, but the crowds and our people are going to expect dancing. So we're going to have to dance and rap, co incorporate the two. So we were always close with all of the very well known dancers in the New York community Latin Quarter Cats, The World, all of that, um, Union Square. Uh, one particular group uh, called Nonstop, uh, Swatch, Little Bit, and Hi Hat. Hi Hat is congratulations to her. So proud of her success. The magic that is Missy Elliott and the choreography. That's Nadine Hi Hat. But her, along with Little Bit and Swatch and them, we were we shared this concern and with other dancers too. What are we going to do? So it was more like a brainstorming thing from dancers and stuff we were already doing and, and dancers sharing their ideas with us and vice versa. But Nadine comes more to the forefront of that memory than the others. Because when you see the Getting Funky video, nonstop they do a move in it where they swing their legs through the middle dancer. 
is not the same thing as the kick step, but it's that leg work in there. So, you know, big up to uh, nonstop and, and, and hi-hat. Got you. Um, you guys are coming to prominence right around the time that rap is taking a turn. It's getting a little harder. Um, you know, you got guys like G-Rap and, and so many of the other street artists that started to emerge at that time. But y'all was squeaky clean. Was that a conscious choice on your part? I don't agree with the squeaky clean part, only because I know me. And the best I can say about that is like, when you see something that ain't broke, why fix it? So here's this moment in time that we're doing something, maybe it's a particular record, a particular video, where we choose to act stupid and silly. Because for me, I want to get the weight of, at this time, I want to get the weight of the street off my back. I ain't interested in having the third eye and looking behind me or whatever. So whatever's going to help relieve me and it's a way to make money without me having to put other people's lives on the line and my own, I'm all for it. So we goofy, you know what I'm saying? I've been around cats that are hard as I don't know what that I can share with cats and behind the scenes we hung out, we silly as all get out because that ain't really in our nature. We want to have fun. We want success the way it should. we were told it should be. So for me, the way I choose to look at it is you caught me in a moment where all right, I'm clean and squeaky, but you gonna pay me for it now? And she likes me too? <laughs> and she likes me? Why the heck I wanna pick up a gun and go shoot up the joint? It's like, you want me to act silly and I can get paid for it? Yeah, you know? I mean, and, and y'all were also, and you could correct me. But that's me for me, I'm, that's speaking on me. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I can't really speak for kid. Kid is who kid is, my dude and all. But for me, it was my answer to leave that behind. You know what I'm saying? And then, you know, once, and I think the same thing happened with gangster music and stuff. Once Cat saw it was working and you're getting something beneficial out of this, let's just keep this up. Like when a person has a hit record, nine times out of 10, when you hear their follow-up record, it's gonna sound very similar to the, to the, to the hit record that they had. So the same thing in this, in this vein in which we speak right now is that, so when people say cliquey, uh, squeaky clean, I kind of feel a certain kind of way about that because I know me behind the curtain. I know me in real life. And it's like, I ain't good. I ain't, like, I could curse with the, at the time, I could curse with the best of them. I could do this with the best of them. You know what I'm saying? Like, when I did class act, I didn't have to really act to do that role. You know what I'm saying? I borrowed from my history. I borrowed from cats I looked up to out in the streets, so forth and so on, you know? Um, random question. Was Russell Simmons managing y'all at the time? No, but I remember when we wanted him to. I remember, like, you know, kid, I love that dude. The stuff we went through, man, because, dude, it took a while for them to get our name straight. We weren't kid and play. They called us Sid and Clay. You know, uh, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Uh, doors being slammed in our face when cats didn't really know what to do with us in the whole nine. And um, I remember, you know, it would have been a big deal for us to be a part of that Russell Simmons you know, uh, empire and stuff. And I remember going to an office where we, you know, it's almost like you're going to see the Wizard of Oz. You think this office is going to be whatever. And we went there, it was like no furniture. It was just this desk. I think he just had a sandwich from Subway sitting on it. <laughs> and he's filling his, filling his face and speaking to us with his mouth half full. And basically just told us, you know, I wouldn't know what to do with y'all. You know, I wouldn't know what to do. And I, looking back, I understand now because he's like, he has his brother and D and all of them. So it's like, okay, what? where do you guys, what is this with, and Houdini and all the rest. He just, he wasn't feeling it, he couldn't see it, but maybe he was telling the truth, or maybe it was it, it was a way to just kindly brush us off. He's like, I wouldn't know what to do with y'all. No, that's fair, that's, a, that's fair. At the time, he, he had a lot of groups, um, and he had his hands full. Y'all, one of the other things I would give to y'all, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Y'all bought gear, like like really gearing into the game. Y'all didn't dress like a typical rapper. Y'all y'all really bought designer clothes, and and it, it was more of a of a fashion statement when you looked at Kid and Play. Was that something that, from your standpoint, we're just doing what we normally do, or was it a finely crafted image that you wanted to go down? You know this, man. It's like, I think that would be the one thing that 
differentiates, I always wanted to say that word, between an era then and an era now. And not to say that cats today are conscious that they're doing it or not doing it, but then it was very important to be as unique as possible. Very important, you know? And it was always that iron sharpening iron, even though it was very competitive at that time, but it was always about how am I gonna stand head and shoulders above the rest? So I, it was a very conscious effort on my part is what, what, what will we do visually in my contribution to be able to achieve that? And we saw that that's what was missing, but influenced somewhat when you looked at Houdini, you know, they weren't doing it like Run DMC. They were like GQ, you know what I'm saying? In a way, but that was the thing with everybody. Where, what, how can I do this? How can we be different in every way possible without taking it too far? So that was my, my, my angle on that as far as our look and things of that nature. And like I said, for me, women were everything. So I want to pay attention to what the girls like. You know what I'm saying? So if this is what's going to get their attention and to get a specific type of quality of woman, so to speak, you know, that had a lot to do with what your presentation was. Because I had always been into older women or like for as long as I can remember. So you ain't really going to come on some teenage tip. You're going to show you can, you're a little bit more than what you may appear to be, if you can. Got you. Speaking of being different, how, how does Kid and Play wind up on tour with N.W.A. How does that come about? <laughs> we were very much loved by Chuck D. Still is. And at the height of Public Enemy's dominance, we did every one of their tours. I am so humbled, and it could almost bring tears to my eyes to think about what we not only were able to witness, but to be a part of. So we're just, we're just finishing up the, the, another umpteenth tour with Public Enemy. So one of the promoters, the last show of this particular tour, I, I'm, I just want to hair up and get up to my room, freshen up, change up, come downstairs again, girls, after party. So I come downstairs and I come down kind of late. And my favorite drink or I wanted to reward myself at the time is I love virgin pina coladas. Someone had told me, yo, Bar shut down, guy ain't trying to hear it, the bartender. I rarely, and I do mean rarely, like to do to do the to, to do to play the to play the play card. But this cat, he's angry. He's like, yo, that's it, bar's closed. So I try to position myself at the bar to go under the light a certain way so he can see who he's saying no to, so he can see he's saying no to play. <laughs> so basically he goes, I don't care who you are. The bar is closed. Oh, well, I'll do without. So the, one of the promoters comes to me and he says, man, we're ready for the next tour. So he gives me the lineup. I really don't want to hear this. I'm, I'm already late for my drink. I don't want to be late for the woman of my choice. So he's like, yo, we got this thing, NWA. He's naming all these groups. And he goes, no, he's going public enemy, of course. Da -da 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 -da. NWA. I was already privy to NWA from our time in L.A. so much. I had heard the cassette tapes prior to them ever blowing up. And like I said earlier, I could curse with the best of them, but like, yo, these guys, <laughs> this is some other stuff right here. You know what I'm saying? So when he came to me with this, I think he thought I didn't know about NWA. And I'm like, nah, dude, nah, nah. So I didn't want to be unreasonable. So I told him, I said, listen, cause he's getting on my nerves now. He would not leave me alone. I said, listen, if you're able to get me a pina colada, I will do the tour. Because I know that the thing shut down. So I kind of had the thing stacked, rigged, knowing he ain't going to get no pina colada. He's like, are you serious? And he didn't know I knew that who he was going to deal with that is closed. So I go over there, make my way to woman kicking it. This guy doesn't only come back with one pina colada. He comes back with two and a half pina coladas. And I have to keep my word. I've always been a person of my word. And with that being said, yeah, so because of me keeping my word, that's how we ended up being a part of that tour, which was such a, so humbling, 
Because who knew that it was going to be as part of history? Like when I saw Straight Outta Compton and seeing that first thing they did, we were there. You know what I'm saying? We were on that show. Uh, our relationship to Tupac, all of that. Some of the stuff we witnessed, but I'm not one to make a big deal out of it. You know, what do they call it? Um, what's the word they call it now when you're... Uh, clout chasing? Clout? Clout chasing? chasing? Yeah, all of that stuff is like, you know, yeah. Okay. You guys, you speaking of movies, y'all surpassed just rap. Kid and Play go on to do five feature films together, all based around hip hop characters and themes. Um, Jazzy Jeff spoke before and he said that originally House Party was written with them in mind, meaning Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. New Line Cinema, if I got this correct, um, they they sued Fresh Prince and Jazzy for the for the nightmare on my street. Similar because it was it, it, it took images from Nightmare on Elm Street. But they liked them so much, they they sued them, got a few dollars, but said, listen, we think you guys got something. We want you to come and you know, audition for a couple of movies and one of those movies just happened to be House Party. Do you know anything about that? Let me help straighten that all out for Go you. ahead. And even Jess will attest to what I'm about to say. The movie was always had Kid and Play in mind. When we would be out there at the uh, independent label social events, the social parties for Christmas and holiday parties and stuff, which was real big at that time, because that was when the indies ruled. Profile records, Sutra records, Select records, all of that. Uh, when we would be at those parties, Reggie and Warrington would always approach us because of our music videos and tell us, yo, we got this script that's perfect for you guys. And we would run into them as their journey would evolve. Kid and Herbie gave them more attention to a certain degree than I did. I wasn't in my head being disrespectful to them because I just didn't see that for myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? To make a movie. Then on top of that, a lot of people don't remember or even know that two of the greatest MCs at that time did a movie too. And it didn't fare very well. And it was called Tougher Than Leather, Run oh, DMC. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So in my mind, thinking I'm a businessman too, if these cats can't pull off a hit movie, which hip hop had been struggling to do for a while to have that box office hit. Wild Style, um, uh, what's the other one um, that uh, Harry Belafonte produced? Um, what are we talking? We're not breaking in, in all of those things. Well, you had you had Crush Groove. Yep. You had Wild Style. I can't. Uh, I hate myself as a movie expert in this one because the one that um, uh, Ozzy Davis's son played the lead in. Uh, it'll come to me when I stop thinking about it. So anyway, these movies didn't fare well, especially with the hip hop community. We felt they weren't really as authentic as they needed to be, and we all had our issues with it. So I'm like, I don't even want to get caught up in that right there. If You're it ain't not broke, don't fix groove. it. It's, I said Crush Groove, Wild Style. It's another one in there. Harry Belafonte had produced it, and the hip-hop community was excited about it because this was the first time a major official movie star was behind a hip-hop movie. It was the one with Ray Don Chong in it. She played the lead. Um, Ozzy Davis's son played it. Anyway, we'll get to it. So anyway, um, so I'm thinking... If it ain't broke, don't fix it. We making more money than we've ever seen in our lives, touring with our music, music videos, records, all of that kind of stuff. So I would just entertain them when they would approach us when we see them at the parties. Real cool guys anyway. So to make a long story short, which might be too late, what ended up happening was they told us that, um, that it was time for a meeting and they wanted us to come to this uh, in Midtown Manhattan up on the umpteen floor with the New Line Cinema powers that be. We went there. They were calling out things for us to do impromptu. We felt like we failed miserably. But what ended up happening was when it was time, it was lunchtime. Yeah, no, school was letting out. It was like 3 o'clock or something like that. I think one of the VIPs of the company was ready to go have some lunch. 
So when it was time for us to leave, we thought we failed miserably. They ain't going to cast us because we are horrible. We go downstairs. The guy, VIP, walks us downstairs. It just happened to be school letting out. When we walked out the door of this building, all these students saw us. Hard to miss us with kids' hair. They lost their minds. We was like Elvis. They were like, our lives was almost, as far as ripping at our clothes the whole nine. The VIP went back upstairs real quick and said, yo, let's cast these guys, because he saw the magic. What happened was, where the Will Smith and my our dude Jeff got involved was, New Line Cinema were trying to be smart businessmen. We're taking a risk with this movie. Let's try and hedge our bets as much as possible. Will Smith and Jeff was established, but it just so happened, right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing, another branch of our company is suing these guys for, like you said, Nightmare on My Street. Will and Jeff is like, what, are you crazy? Asking us to do a movie and you're suing us too? So they wasn't having it. But Reggie and Warrington Hudlin the producers and the creators and the director of House Party wanted us from Jump Street. Wow. Great story. Beat Thanks Street. for clearing that up. Um, Beat Street. Beat Street. There you go. Beat Street. Beat Street. Yeah. Um, y'all work with a comic legend in House Party, Robin Harris. Kid had some really crazy stories about Robin. Is there anything in particular you remember working alongside of him? I didn't do, if I don't even think I did any scenes with Robin. That was him and Kid, mostly. What I would do, we love for, to get Robin going. You know what I'm saying? So it was like this thing I'd call this campfire when we would be on our break, or let's say, you know, before they set up the next lighting or the next scene, we'd have these times to be off. For me, when Kid and Robin had major scenes to do, eight times out of 10, I would be off that day. But I would go visit the set. We needed to hear Robin start snapping. So I would be that sacrificial lamb and say something about his mother or talk about how black he is just to get him started. And he's going to come in on me because I'm coming in on him. But I didn't care. That's how much we needed to hear him do his thing. So that was like the relationship I had with him. I was more closer with uh, Bernie Mac when it was time to do House Party 3 than it was to do um, House Party 1 with Robin. But no, that's that's a kid's jewel right there. Gotcha. My, most of my stuff was with Martin most of the time. And I was about to go there because that movie really kicked off the careers of some legendary artists of our time. I mean, you have Martin Lawrence and Tisha Campbell. Um, they would later reunite in the Martin show. John Witherspoon was the angry neighbor, uh, full force. Did you realize at the time that there was something special about the casting of this film? I think I was in such awe, and still to this day, believe it or not, still trying to, it's still surreal. You know, I could be home when I have the opportunity to start doing some channel surfing and House Party or one of our movies or something will be on. And I'm like, I can never be in a spot like, yeah, that's me. I did nothing like that. It's like, it's just surreal. Matter of fact, with me, the minute it gets to my part in a movie or a music video, I'll switch to another channel. But it's just surreal to me. But no, I, I didn't realize the time. It was a big party because for us all, except for Tisha, who had some experience under her belt, it was a first for us all. And it was, it was, it was just something really incredible. So again, when I talked about the end excuse me, talked about the NWA and other experiences like it. It's amazing the journey, almost like Dorothy through the Wizard of Oz, all these people that we met, know, call friends, and just be able to watch as they've gone on in their careers and seeing them in other things and be able to say, I know them, you know, I could call them now and say hello, you know, type thing. It's, it's super cool, you know what I'm saying? But so humble, it's humbling, truly humbling. No, it must be. Uh, y'all had, and right now your career is blowing up. That movie blows up. Everybody, it's a classic at this point. You get an animated TV series, cartoon. Kid, during his interview, and I don't know if you would remember this specifically, but he was saying the cartoon comes out, is voiced by Martin Lawrence and Tommy Davidson 
after a year, they decide to cancel it. And you guys go on to tell the studio, look, if you cancel our cartoon, we don't want to do anything else with the studios. No TV shows, no movies, no nothing. Do you remember that? I do. You were dealing with two people who weren't recognizing change. Because shortly after that, a year or so, it wasn't personal. It's not like they removed all cartoon series. They removed all cartoon series and brought in the real stuff like Hang Time and all those other shows. You know, there was real life shows for teenagers and kids. So we were taking it personal, but it wasn't personal. It was a, a big change in Saturday morning programming that was taking place. And we were a casualty of that. But the thing about it was that they still wanted to do things with us. You know, if somebody was to ask me what would be that one regret or that second thought in regards to an opportunity that we had that we didn't feel at the time was when Quincy Jones wanted to do another show right after his success with Fresh Prince and Jazzy Jeff. Enter them back in again. But now he wanted to do a show with us. But what he pitched to us, and God bless Quincy, we love him so much, is um, now looking back on it, it doesn't seem like such a bad idea, especially with imagining the residual checks to Jeff and, and, <laughs> and Will and them get. He wanted to do a show where we were going to be roommates with Don Rickles, the comedian. And we're like, you know what I'm saying? We, 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 we're all caught up in our ways, hip hop mentality, all of that stuff. But looking back on it, it probably would have won because pretty much anything Quincy touched was, you know, diamond and platinum and stuff. But then his thing with us was, we want to do something. What do y'all want to do? And I'll never forget Kid looked over at me because he always knew a dream that I had for us as far as a nice progression in films. I wanted to do a remake of um, Uptown Saturday Night. And they loved the idea. And it began the procedure to do it, even to the point where Quincy thought it'd be best if we got the blessings of the two leads, which was Sidney Poitier and Bill Cosby. So we went uh, and met them, went to uh, Sidney Poitier's, not no, not no estate. This guy had a villa, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And to meet him was awesome and incredible. And then uh, Bill Cosby eventually too, and we got their blessings, but it, the, the script just never panned out. But um, yeah, I hope I answered the question. No, you did, you did. Okay. Um, just moving it along, I want to talk because you, you you guys are riding high. You come out um, with the Funhouse album. That's certified gold. Could be platinum. Um, it is. From, all of it's platinum. All of it's ahead. platinum. <laughs> <laughs> you move on to uh, House Party 2. Mm. Martin Lawrence. Kid told a story about Martin Lawrence and at that time Cameron from, and not, and not Cameron from Dipset, but Cameron from uh, the uh, young, young black, black teenagers. teenagers. Did you know right. that they got into actual fist fight? I didn't know about that. I kind of heard that recently myself. I didn't. I didn't even know about that. You know, uh, Martin was a funny guy. Then you know he'd be kind of extra sensitive if he thought you were talking about him and mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So the form of boxing him would come out quite often. You know, I remember when he was about to get into it. And, I, I can only go but so far because I only remember so much of the details. But I remember one of the biggest events that I think would happen in Monday nights in L.A. It was called L.A. Live. And it was a spot where the, I think the club would float different places, this event in different clubs. I might be wrong about that. But you never knew who was going to get up on the mic and sing. But it was always or perform. It was always going to be somebody. So you could count on that. You wouldn't be disappointed, but it would be a surprise of the night, pretty much. And you get this concert, you know, with them. And I'll never forget uh, Martin almost getting ready to get into it with Keith Washington one time. That was uh, that was funny. But Martin, you know, <laughs> being an ex boxer, he he had no uh, he had no shame in his game when it came time to showing you. He knew he knew something about putting the paws on you. <laughs> Martin Lawrence, one of the funniest. Oh, we'd have to cool ever. him out all the time. Like, yo, man, he just said hello. Calm down. That's all. You know, that kind of thing like that, you know. Oh, my God. I didn't like Who the way he said hello to me. Yeah. <laughs> on, on, on the Face the Nation album that y'all had, y'all actually did a diss record against Luke? Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I don't think much of that kind of stuff. 
The thing was, is that we had did something on, uh, we were BET's favorites, one of them. And we did a show, I forgot which show it was, with Salt and Pepper. And uh, one of the girls, it said something about Luke and them. And uh, Kid and I didn't say anything, but it was a guilt by association thing. And I guess by the time it got to Luke, it was like we said something or by us just sitting there, you know, guilt by association or whatever the case may be. And then it turned into uh, whatever it turned into. But eh, I don't get into that stuff. Yeah, I know Luke came back with a song. I was like, you know, like. No, he started it. He started. So Luke actually yeah, started. He started it. it. Wow. Yeah, because of because of that. That's why I told that part of it because he, I guess, heard through bad word of mouth or whatever that we had disrespected him. But I think the girls was commenting on his dancers or the the uh, what do you call it the uh, things you do with girls the the objectiveness of the women and all of that. I think I, I don't even remember. But you know me, I you know. I'm in the back. Got you. Again, you know, you go into House Party 3, Class Act. You're working with huge, iconic names. Um, House Party 3 in particular, you got Bernie Mac, uh, Angela Means, who played Felicia. In Friday, you got Chris Tucker, again Friday. A.J. Johnson, Friday. Friday, Gilbert Gottfried. Friday took yeah. a lot of the cast that really came from House Party. Again, did you really, and you know, even going backwards, House Party 2, you work with uh, Queen Latifah, Iman, if I can remember correctly, was in that, were you guys putting together, like this, this is huge. Like hip hop is no longer just that thing that was in the hood. Hip hop now is becoming commercially viable it is big business because these stars have gone on to achieve great success in their own right. Yeah, I mean, the answer is no, we didn't realize it. You know, I, I wasn't focused on the possibilities or the potential future of it as a whole or particular individuals. I knew they were great. I knew we'd have a good time. Uh, you know, you want things to win so you could continue on. But like I said, now looking back at it, not realizing it, and, and I think that's a good thing because sometimes when you know or you think you know, you ruin it. But when you don't know, you're doing you. And you look back and you go, wow, you know, uh, you can see how God had his hand in it, especially. But at the same time, you know, just not really. I think sometimes if you know too much or you think you know too much, you stand to ruin it. But to watch all of it, it was just really just having fun and the anticipation of who's coming on board. You know, I, I have VHS tapes of people who tried out. I have a VHS ta tapes of those who tried out. I think, yeah, that's my love interest in Class Act or one of those. And one of those people to try it out, among other famous ones to skip my mind, is Lauren Hill. Really? Yeah. I have a tape of her trying out for... Uh, one of the parts. I think my love interest in one of the movies. Wow. But who knew that then? It's not like I looked at it and we're there. I think I was there at the reading and stuff. And you go, oh, we got to get her. That's Lauren Hill. No, we didn't. If anything, I think at the most she had done at that time was her, what she did with one of the Sister Act movies and stuff like that. You know, so no, no one was their own that we know them today. Got you. Speaking of love interest, you go on to marry actress Sherry Headley. Right. In 93, have a child together. Um, you guys didn't stay married very long. I, no. is, is it just a case of two artists in the, in the same house? Uh, it was a case. I can't speak for her. I know me. I was coming to a place in my life where a lot of stuff wasn't doing it for me anymore. And I'm thinking, like I've heard most people think, oh, it must be time to get serious and settle down. And who else better to with this model actress, you know, as most people choose to refer to her, what's her name in uh, Coming to America? Um, Lisa McDowell. I mean, yeah, Lisa McDowell. Know you know, Lisa who doesn't McDowell. want to marry Lisa McDowell? Plus, on t at that time, she was in the soap operas doing All My Children. So we, we were great friends prior to getting married. That used to be our motto whenever things would come to a, a, a certain 
delicate point, uh, our motto, it should, we should have made T-shirts out of it. Who else better than to marry than your best friend? Because that's how we felt about each other. So for me, I just felt running through Hollywood and New York and every other state and city a man could run through, it's time to, to settle down. And then now I'm beginning, as I would phrase then, not knowing what I know now, there's some degree of spirituality beginning to enter into my conscious and subconscious. And I just feel now that, you know, get out while the getting's good, so to speak, because I'm into my clothing thing now, you know, and things of that nature. So um, I think it's time to get married. And who else better than this sought after woman and things? So my agenda, my motive wasn't the way it should be entering into a marriage and into a relationship. So as a man and, and owning up to that, that was my, uh, my fault and to a certain degree kind of being reckless in it. But, you know, that was it. I can say with pride and credit to God that it was never an issue of me cheating on her or calling her out of her name or, you know, beating anything like that. It was just Christopher Martin wasn't Christopher Martin yet. So I guess the word is too soon. Understood. Yeah. Understood. You you speak uh, about your faith um, a lot. What was it that was it anything in particular that made you become a born again Christian? Uh, because I know right around that time is it, it felt like you started to kind of give your life to Christ. What happened to me in part is what I sometimes call in my speaking twilight zone. It's like I said, sharing this with my father yesterday, the day before. I feel as though and believe as though God can come at you through two different ways. The most public way we know is when people lose everything. And I can relate to that experience too, but he could also get your attention when he gives you everything you think you want and nothing's doing it for you. Nothing. You feel even more emptier. And now that's even more of a reason to consider suicide because you're like, what else is left? You know, it's a real twilight zone situation and with a, with a nice oregano of torment in there as well. So for me, as I had experience and owning everything and doing everything, I mean, come on, man. You know, we super cool with Michael Jordan, Shari Headley. I've been with this woman. I've done this. I drive this, 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 and that. And I ain't happy. I'm not fulfilled. And that was a problem because I'm seeking happiness what really I'm desiring is joy and fulfillment. But anyway, so for me, that was it. I was really feeling tormented because nothing's working. The car ain't doing it for me. How many cars do I need to buy? The jewelry, who I know, where I go, all of that. It's like, and then, you know, even when after shortly after getting married, I was like, oh, damn, this ain't it. To no fault of hers, but I'm thinking she's going to be something only Jesus could be. I'm thinking the car, what I own, what I do, who I know can be the answers to the thing that only Jesus can be the answer to. And that's, you know, my fault again and my responsibility or lack thereof. So that was the main thing that caught my attention. Plus having a praying grandmother and a father that I witnessed do what he did, accomplish what he did, have the kind of name recognition in the in them streets and what he accomplished and all of that to see him go through what he went through and then to be man enough to go, I'm wrong, I got to go back and do some things over, which he didn't get the best cooperation out of me and the rest of my family with because, yeah, we're going to be suspect. It's like, oh, you just saying this because you in prison is your way to use God to get out early. And it wasn't about that. He was the real deal and has been born again and saved for well over 30 years now. My father's approaching 84, but he's the real deal. So for me to see that as an example, to see a man say, I'm wrong, and to have such greatness and wealth and the kind of friends he had, because my father was part of that Nicky Barnes thing there, that Guy Fisher and all of that. That was that element. The places that we went to, uh, that he would bring the family to for the barbecues, meeting these cats that owned ranches with horses and in-ground pools, you know, it's one thing you had above-ground pool. That was never, but you had an in-ground pool, you saying something, you know what I'm saying? So, oh, what little we, that impresses us. But anyway, um, yeah, so to see this man do this, and who else better than your father prayerfully, and um, even what's going on in my own life, you know, it, that one of those 38 sub-noses that I owned, I was trying to work up the nerve to end my life with. 
oh, three wow. days trying to work up the, the nerve to pull the trigger to end my life because, again, it's one thing if you don't have everything and you lose everything, you could go, all right, I'm unhappy because I need to get this or I want to have this. If I have this, I'll be all right. But when you've had it all or you do have it all and you're feeling even worse than the person that don't have it all, oh, man, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Wow. Or divorce. Wow. They milked, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's crazy because coming off of this story, you know, I'm taking it back to a lighter place, but they really milked this house party franchise for all that it was worth. <laughs> and, they, and they're not done yet. <laughs> Are you serious? Oh, you know, they, 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 they just casted the two leads in the House Party reboot, LeBron James. Oh, my, okay. So, so, yeah. so that's why, because House Party 4 and 5, I don't even know if you or Kid was in those two. But, you know, LeBron James, King James, he's obviously a fan of the franchise. Loves it. Loves it. He did a, a commercial, if I'm correct, with um, State Farm. Where, where, you know, he's listening to your music and he's doing the kickstep dance. What'd you think about no, that? No, we were involved with that. You they, got they, they came, Yeah, they, well, we got paid for it. And plus they wanted the permission. And there were some things that went on that they had to work out to do the dance and all of that. But no, he's, LeBron, that's our modern day Michael Jordan, so to speak of, in Kid and Play's life. But, you know, he loves House Party. I don't know how he feels about two and three, but I know definitely one. But when his kids, his sons was young, he was doing the haircuts on them and putting them up on Instagram or whatever. And even the Allstate commercial and all of that. So to me, I could imagine the thrill he must have to be in a position to have this movie that you love to be in the position in power to do it again and maybe even have your own. You know what I'm saying? That's that's dope. That's dope. No, that's, that's really dope. dope. It really is. Uh, it, it, Salt and Pepper biopic recently came out. Um, right. You guys were portrayed in the, mu in, in the movie. What would you think about it? <laughs> it's funny. I wasn't planning on watching it right away, but it caught me at a moment when the premiere came on and I had finished with some work earlier because I'd been working on this documentary that I hope we talk about um, that, um, you know, I went ahead and watched the thing. And the first time, the, the, you know, the kid and play thing come up, the image of it and, the, and, a, and a comment about it, her character, the one who's playing her character, calls me a dog. Oh, that's playing. He's a dog. You know, watch out for him. So I text her right away and said, a dog, Cheryl? So she texts back saying, I'm sorry I didn't direct it. You know, that's our girl. So anyway, um, I thought they took quite a bit of some creative license, creative license, Creative license. Play, again, interesting transition in your life. Rapper, um, coming from the street, movie star, and you have transitioned into being an artist and a professional um, in residence at three historically black universities and colleges, um, including Miles College, North Carolina, Central University, and Florida A&M. How did, they, how did that come about, the, the whole teaching and lecturing scene? I went through a bad patch financially. I lost my home, lost pretty much everything. And uh, I was doing a lot of gospel stage plays on the road with that for quite a while. That was a great time doing stuff with Tony Terry and Damian Hall from Guy and Ralph Tresorin from New Edition and all of it. So many, I shouldn't even have started naming. It's way more G from... Um, uh, Little G, what, is, what group is he? Was Silk. Um, but anyway, uh, during one break with one of the tours, landed us in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, because most of the cast, the foundation of the cast was from there. So when I was there for a short stint, you know, as a layover till it was time to get back out on the road again with that, uh, some people wouldn't leave me alone about how they felt I should meet the president of Miles College. God bless his heart. It's such a blessing to me, uh, Albert Sloan, uh, and big up to the Sloan family. Uh, there was a big, I think a prayer breakfast that was taking place the day after I had planned on leaving. And some people wanted me to stay to make it to the breakfast to meet President Sloan. 
I didn't want to meet him because I didn't know anything about college thing. Kicked out of five high schools, no relationship with higher learning. So it's time to, um, they talk me into it. So I go to this breakfast. There's this greeting or reception line where the two lines pass each other and you shake hands to meet. So finally he and I meet, President Sloan. Make a long story short, he gave me that look that I hadn't seen since that cop who let me go in the train station. And he wanted to know how long was I going to be in town and again wanted me to stay an extra day to meet with him for breakfast or something. So we met and he had this idea because he saw my celebrity. He saw how people were responding to me at this breakfast. The school was going through troubles at the time, like almost where the chains, locks and chains was getting ready to be put on the front door. So he had this vision and this idea for me to consider being a part of the school coming in what would be called an artisan residence. And to be there, and basically I was gonna be a glorified recruitment representative, to go visit the high schools and say that I'm there and how important school is and all of that. I ain't mad at him. If I was to accept it, there would be a pay, but also for me to sit in on some classes and to learn. And I'm at this place now where the Lord has allowed me to get beat up so much in life I'm just open for stuff I probably wouldn't have been open to two or three years prior. So he is very smart in that, and I accepted it. Now, I'm not here to say it was because of me being there that the school got saved. Many other ideas he had worked. Like, football is big in the South with the schools, colleges. So the school was winning. He rebuilt the team, the band, people loving the band, all of that. All of these things he had on different cylinders was working. That's when I got reintroduced or introduced into the higher learning community. And from that, and certain people meeting me and watching me from afar, North Carolina Central University came into play when my time was up at Miles College. Then meeting Chancellor Ammons, who had this vision of preserving hip hop and keeping it where it belongs in the schools in the black community, in the HBCUs. So he brought me and Ninth Wonder and Dr. Kawachi Clemens together, and that blew up. And with that, it was interesting because during my tenure there, I always wanted to say that word too, was that, um, and thank you that I could say these words. Yeah. I have a chance to say. <laughs> but anyway, um, friends would come through or people that I knew so we would do surprise guests with the class. We thought it was going to be just a regular class in a regular classroom. That class went up to 167 students where we had to do it in the auditorium at North Carolina Central University. So we would have surprise guests come through that just happened to be in town to do a show or whatever. And like Trey Songs, D from Run DMC, um, uh, friends at the time with Ninth and probably still is David Banner. All of them would come through. But we would never tell the students who was coming through because we didn't know they might at the last minute because their schedule have to cancel. So they won't egg on our face. So it became a thing with us that who's going to show up today. So that did well. And Chancellor Ammons ended up accepting a position of president at FAMU, wanted me and Dr. Clemens to come. And we did. And that's how that happened there. So that's how a lot of that happened in regards to me being able to uh, get an unorthodox learning as well as being prayerfully a blessing to the students and showing them uh, and sharing with them very transparently what my life almost cost me by not having an education. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, you're working on some exciting things these days. You seem to have a love for film um, from being behind the camera. And I dance. Talk to me about this documentary that you produced. Why talk about the dancers? Because they're kind of the, the unsung heroes of hip hop. And you go into the golden era of dancers, the 80s and 90s, where you had the big les and, and all of the, the, the wonderful choreographers that came out of that era. Why was that film important for you to make and um, just share a little bit about what people can expect if they see it. That film means, or this work means more to me than is actually on the surface. 
when I became, so to speak, play from kid in play, what was before me was a fork in the road, either to be this musical artist or to be an artist. So as I'm approaching 59, which I choose to call act three, is that I'm so blessed enough now to be able to explore maybe what would have happened if I would have followed that road, being a graphic artist, graphic artist going into cinematography as well. I'm working on a very special project that entwines the two. Uh, being able to, to create work that has become iconic, the salt and pepper logo, Kid and Play's logo, Heavy D's logo, the salt and pepper jackets, Kid and Play's gear, stuff I've done for Michael Jordan and all of that, for it to be as, some of it to be as iconic as it's become, but also to have a chance now to live and these ideas in this amusement park I call the mind of mine, thank you Jesus, to be able to bring it to fruition. And the idea of this subject matter that you're talking about, this dance thing, I'm like, that's something that hasn't been explored or told. And a lot of people want to give Kid and Play credit for our dancing. And as much as that may be so, it was always more important to us that we first displayed in our music video, Getting Funky, that we come from a community of dancers. So I thought this would be a great thing to contribute if there was a time capsule that was created what went on in the 80s with hip hop, 70s, 80s, 90s? Well, here's another part of the story. These ones who worked in these low budget, sometimes no budget music videos that now we consider the classics, that how most of them then went on to dance for the biggest artists in music history, Whitney Houston, Madonna, Prince, Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson, the list goes on. So for their stories to be told, meant a lot to me, but as me as a person to get out of my system and to answer that question, what would have been if I would have pursued the artistic part? I joke, and it's really true, if it wasn't for God, I'd be probably be a starving artist, but even to design the poster work for it and then to be behind the camera with the help of some students as well uh, to, to do this, but it meant a lot to be able to salute and as we say today, give them their flowers while they're alive. Three of them have passed, like one of my Biggest successes, thank you, Jesus, who's my lawyer, ma uh, lawyer, agent, manager, and accountant, is to get two of the original Soul Train gang dancers in this piece. One of them passed. He's Tyrone the Bone Proctor, who was responsible for this dance called Whacking that Jody Watley displayed in her hit music videos that now people know as Voguing, that Madonna took or borrowed. Um, you know, to get these stories out for people Two things I wanted to accomplish amongst others. Hopefully for young ladies to see you don't have to compromise the values that hopefully your parents instilled in you to get success. And then number two, to be inspired by those who didn't have professional training, that didn't have a lot of money to accomplish what they accomplished. It was pure raw talent and just being at the right place at the right time and being ready even if you don't get to go. And the stories are fascinating and enlightening and encouraging. And I'm just glad that I had the opportunity to give this as a gift because it's I'm not charging anybody to see the film. You know, I joined forces with, we didn't mention him, a childhood friend of mine, teenage friend, and we're close still to this day, Ron Lawrence, who was responsible for Biggie's, one of Biggie's biggest hits, Notorious, one of biggest uh, Jay-Z's biggest street credible records, Where I'm From, stuff he's done with LL, Aretha Franklin, all of this stuff. He started a streaming platform which gave me the platform to put this on to make the documentary free for everybody, you know? It's a gift. Beautiful. And I don't think money should be in the way between the gift and who the gift is intended for. What's the name of the streaming platform? Because we want to send uh, the Vlad TV viewers over there to see it. It's Streamwaves, streamwaves.com, S-T-R-E-A-M-W-A-Z-E.com streamways.com that's where it's at beautiful before i leave the topic a lot of these dancers are now parents uh entrepreneurs they've gone community on, leaders all of them yeah. exactly did any of the stories surprise you in the end one of the things i say in my presentation with this is that i'm so glad i didn't have to go to any kind of mental or drug rehabilitation centers to see a particular dancer you know, every one of them is doing their thing. You know, it's funny. 
excuse me, the reason why it's called and I dance, it's the end of a sentence. So like you just said, any one of these dancers could say, I'm a community leader, I'm a successful parent, I'm a teacher, I'm this, this. Oh, by the way, and I danced. And then the listener would go, dance, dance for who? And then the story begins. So there was almost everybody's story amazes me. The reason why I had to get the two Soul Train dancers in it because almost 98% of the dancers all start off with Saturday morning watching Soul Train. And th most of them, probably all of them, not one of them said, I couldn't wait to dance on the Grammys. I don't remember any of them said, I can't wait to dance for the American Music Awards. All of them, even as artists, our aspirations was to be one day to be on Soul Train. If you're on Soul Train, you're good. You know, and I want to thank, you know, some of the other artists that are on this, Genuine, Omarion, um, Danny Lee, uh, Seven Streeter, D Damian Hall, that talked about how much dancers meant to them. But the stories in it, I wouldn't do justice by just picking out one or two. One dancer in particular, Omar, who danced, well known for dancing in almost every Janet Jackson video. She, he was that light-skinned, ball-headed dude that always danced with her. The fact that how he met his father for the first time was almost getting kicked out of the Latin Quarter, sneaking in through the back because he was underaged and the bouncer was his father. And that's how he met his father. So it's like stuff like that. The stories, uh, some may bring tears to your eyes with laughter and sadness, but definitely inspirational. And I wasn't on no tip. And I could have, because some people did speak on it, but that's not what it was about. I wasn't on no tip to talk about what really went on backstage with certain artists and controversy and any of that. I just wanted it to, to take it to a place like what Versus does, like what D-Nice does with their platforms. They take us back to that feel-good era, those feel-good moments in our life. But from the perspective of the dancers that you had a crush on or you wanted to do their moves, like you said, with Big Les, I got Josie in here too. Who remembers Josie? One of the fly girls with the braids. I got, you know, God bless me to get them all. There's some I couldn't get because of scheduling, but for the most part, uh, God bless me to do my thing. Before I let you go, you teamed up with Will Packer in BT this year, 2021, um, to work on the new scripted series, Bigger. Can you tell us about that and your involvement in it? Well, I wish I teamed up with Will Packard in it, but... <laughs> Will Packard and his people reached out to me to see if I was interested in a particular recurring role in it. And uh, I still had to, you know, it was during the pandemic, so did the Zoom thing with the reading and all. And, uh, you know, it was an honor. And I, I can make a big thing out of little things from some people's perspective, but how many times have we seen films we enjoyed? And if you pay attention to the credits and see who did, for instance, who did the casting, Robbie Reed, you see that name all in there. So to meet her for the first time, believe it or not, and then for her to tell me that, you know, she had been wanting to work before but didn't have a way to get to me. But just to, to meet her and have to work with her on something, even if it didn't work. And um, the beautiful showrunner and inventor, Felicia. I don't want to mess, mess up her last name, so I just say Felicia. But Will Packard being the, the executive producer. And uh, they got me in there and, uh, you know, I did my thing as age appropriate role. Some people might find it a little odd being, you know, I don't like the term, nothing against it. I don't like the term for myself being called a Christian. I like being a believer because when you say Christian, everybody has a different box for what that means. Believer, straight to the point. So. Some people may find it odd when they see some of my earlier parts in some of the episodes, the kind of character I play, but where it ends up. Is, is a good place. But uh, that that helped scratch an itch for me or quest a thirst because, you know, people did approach me during nice uh, uh, plateaus in Kid and I's career where, like, what I consider doing solo acting, but I wanted to be loyal to the friendship, first and foremost, loyal to what we call the brand now, and turned a lot of things down. Some of those movies I can mention, some people might be a little surprised when they say, I wonder how it would have been if Play did those roles. But um, now in my act three, you know, I was just curious to see how that might work. And I'm glad I had that opportunity and we'll see where that goes. So, but yeah, it's bigger. Only thing I regret about doing that role is it caught me off guard. And I, I guess I misunderstood the title. I thought I had to be bigger. So I got, <laughs> 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 but it didn't mean that. But anyway, um, 
No, um, I'm, 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 I'm glad I had the opportunity to do that and we see that where that goes. I'm in another series too called Church Folks on Amazon Prime with Dorian Wilson from the Parkers. And that's a real good show too uh, about uh, the behind the scenes of what really goes on with churches and the church staff, which isn't too pleasant or pretty sometimes. But I'm having a good time living my life now. I want to enjoy the fruits of my labor. Um, I, I, knowing what I know now and continue to learn just to experience some things. And thank you for being a part of being a part of my checklist. How is it to be with Prez on Vlad TV? Christopher Martin, AKA Play. It has been my pleasure. I, I thank you because we learned so much about you, uh, not just the public side of you, but the spiritual side, and just you as a man and, and your openness and candidness and, and you telling these great stories, you know, it, it's been our pleasure. And on behalf of Vlad TV, I thank you. Salute.